So um, without further ado, we're going to keep talking about state expiration today. And uh, I think uh, Garen dropped a bit of a bomb uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, I think we're going to start with that. And uh, Garen, if you can give us a quick overview of uh, some of the suggested changes. Yeah, sure. So up until this point, um, the current like state expiration proposal has had this thing called a rent balance. So essentially what you would do is that um, whenever you, you know, create an entry or want to do a rent bump, you would put XLM into this rent balance and then every ledger, a variable amount of um, a fee called the rent fee would be removed from this rent balance. And the rent fee could either uh, decrease or increase based on the size of the bucket list and network usage. So the reasoning behind this initially was that we want to provide some sort of market equilibrium that as the bucket list gets larger and as the um, price of writing to the bucket list increases, we also have increased pressure to evict and expire entries out of the bucket list. And so the thinking with this kind of variable rent fee is that as the bucket list grows, you, the rent fee also grows and so that you deduct uh, rent balance more aggressively and so more entries will fall to zero or negative rent balances and then be expired more frequently. So that's kind of the original thinking as to why we had this variable uh, rent balance and this variable rent fee. Now, the issue with that is there's two primary issues. Uh, the first is just the user experience story. So with rent balance, because the rent fee that's deducted is variable from ledger to ledger, you can estimate how many ledgers you think your entry will be live on the network, but you can't know for certain. So for instance, say if you initially paid for 100 ledgers of rent, um, but you know there are a bunch of merges so the bucket list size decreased a lot, then your entry could live much longer. Uh, conversely, if you paid for, say, 10 years of rent, your entry might only last one year if the network explodes in popularity and the bucket list size increases. And so it's this kind of weird user interface where the users expect an entry's lifetime to be measured in ledgers, but really you have like this rent balance and like this variable thing and you really can't control it. And so that was issue number one is that it was uh, difficult for users to understand and didn't have a great user story. Uh, the second issue is that of downstream systems. And so because the rent fee is variable from ledger to ledger, you don't know when, uh, or you can't predict what the rent fee will be, and so you cannot predict an entry's rent balance. Now, in Stellar Core, we have like this bucket list data structure, which is like, you know, specially designed with this uh, multiple levels and like this log structured merge tree approach. And we've designed uh, the rent balance uh, system to work very well with the bucket list, such that um, on bucket list and on bucket list DB, you always know exactly how much rent balance your entry has. And we can do this efficiently without iterating through every entry and then, you know, decrementing its rent balance by the current ledger's rent fee. Uh, we can, like, you know, get around it using some optimizations of the bucket list structure. Now, the issue for downstream systems is that downstream systems uh, don't have a copy of the bucket list. Uh, the, you know, they're running captive core, uh, but the way that uh, captive core and core is currently designed, it's too expensive to query a captive core directly. And so that means that in order for these downstream systems, uh, prim primarily Horizon and uh, sort of on RPC nodes, in order for them to have accurate rent balance information, what they would need is to <clears throat> essentially uh, either maintain their own version of the bucket list and apply rent via like a copy of the bucket list or do some like very inefficient operations um, with like SQL where you like essentially cache uh, some amount of rent fees and then lazily apply them in the background. Or something like that. But in either case, it's, uh, it's a lot of work for downstream systems, and a lot of disk I.O. and things like that. So those are the, these are the two main drawbacks. And so when thinking about this issue, we thought from kind of first principles, okay, do we need this variable rent fee? Do we need a rent balance? Or can we use a definitive expiration ledger? Uh, and so that's kind of what today's conversation about is rent balance versus expiration ledger. Now how the expiration ledger works is instead of having um, the ledger entry store a rent balance field that is periodically deducted from, Instead, all it stores is a single entry, which is expiration ledger. And it's very simple. Essentially, before the expiration ledger, the entry is live and accessible. After the expiration ledger, the entry has run out of rent and is not um, accessible. And then once um, the entry is passed its expiration ledger, uh, it can be expired, which is when it's deleted from the bucket list. And then if it's a temporary entry, it can be permanently deleted. Or if it's a restorable entry, it's deleted and then state, sent to a state restoration node or something like that. Now, the advantages uh, to the expiration ledger approach are that it's significantly easier for downstream systems because they don't have to periodically update entries uh, with rent balance information. 
uh, the meta that's initially emitted whenever an entry is created or an entry receives a rent bump will tell downstream systems exactly when an entry should expire. And so it's pretty straightforward from uh, the implementation standpoint. It also makes a lot more sense for users who expect that a lifetime is measured in kind of ledger, uh, discrete and predictable values. Now, the drawback to this is that we can't have this dynamic eviction pressure feature that we have in rent balance. So how the expiration ledger implementation would work with respect to fees is what we would do is take whatever the current market rent fee rate is based on the size of the blacklist, and then uh, lock that rate in and charge that rate for the entire lifetime of the object or the, of the entry. So for instance, say you are creating a new entry that has one year's worth of rent, you would be charged one year's worth of rent at the current um, rent fee. Now, the issue with this is suppose that within that year, the bucket list size increases significantly. Um, essentially, what you would be doing is because you locked in that rate when the size was small, you'd be paying an artificially low rate compared to other uh, entries that are being added onto the network later. And so you have this weird system where these entries can be kind of grandfathered in, so to speak, such that they pay uh, low fees because they just got in at the ground level when the network was low. And so with rent balances, you don't have this grandfather thing because even if you create an entry on day zero on Soroban launch day when the bucket list was at you know, theoretical smallest size, because uh, every entry is subject to the same variable rent fee, no matter when they were created, um, the old entries and new entries are charged the same rate. However, because you have to essentially lock in the rate on creation time or on bump time with an expiration ledger approach, that's not possible. And so I think what we want to think about um, if we want to make expiration ledgers work, because I think the two benefits um, to downstream systems and to the user experience are very, very significant benefits. And so we should think about expiration ledgers pretty seriously. I think that we need to make sure, I think the thing we want to prevent most are kind of two scenarios. First, where you have a system where users or there's smart contract that can essentially provide a storage interface for cheaper than the protocol can. Uh, if you could imagine, say, on day zero, when the bucket list is small, uh, someone spins up a smart contract that has public functions that exactly mirror um, the storage functions uh, of that the protocol exposes. So you have like, you know, get, um, you know, create just the exact same interface. But instead of calling it um, dr directly through the Sorbonne SDK, you would just make a call to a smart contract for your storage needs. And so what this storage contract could do is it could just, you know, buy up, say, the maximum amount of uh, ledger entries possible um, on day zero with, say, like 100 years of rent or some very large value, and essentially permanently lock in those entries for 100 years at the lowest possible rent fee. And then, say, two or three years down the line, you know, if the Stellar network explodes and is huge, the rent fee will be significantly higher. And so what this contract can do is essentially auction off this rent space at a artificially low rate. And so you can essentially use a middleman contract uh, to get cheaper storage than you could if you actually went to the protocol directly. And so this is really bad from a network uh, health perspective because essentially every storage call now has to pass this middleman. And so you have lots of additional traffic, lots of additional um, overhead for serving storage just because essentially you have a bug and uh, exploitability in the way that you charge rent. And so I think to prevent against that specific exploit where you have like these, um, these storage contract interfaces what you would need is some sort of upper bound on the amount of uh, ledger or the um, lifetime of an entry at any given point. Essentially, the thinking being that, you know, <clears throat> if you allow arbitrarily large amounts of rent purchases, then you could say lock in an entry for 100 years, which is far too long because the price will probably significantly increase in that lifetime. But if you have a maximum uh, lifetime of, say, six months, it's unlikely that a storage contract interface could be profitable uh, with only six months difference between the initial rent fee paid and then the uh, rent fee they'd be providing their users. And so I think the plan is if we do expiration ledgers is to have a network parameter, which is the maximum rent uh, or the maximum lifetime of a given entry on the ledger. And so this could be something like six months or one year, and this would be a network parameter. And so what we can do is you want this uh, value to be as large as possible uh, from a user perspective just so that you can provide the most flexibility and usability. Um, but you want it to be small enough such that you don't have these rent-related exploits. And so that would be a uh, number that we can change via network vote, just so that we can essentially tune this value up or down as we see exploits happening on the network or as we see that no exploits are happening on the network.
in addition to this issue, we also um, kind of like the, the middleman storage contract. We also want to make sure that we're not allowing a bunch of spam entries to lock in very low rates, take up space on the network, and then essentially up the price for everyone else that's doing legitimate work that's not spam. And so you can imagine that on day zero, when the you know uh, bucket list size is small, you have a bunch of airdrops that uh, take whatever the maximum lifetime is, say six months, a year, whatever, and then essentially just mint spam airdrop tokens until the bucket list size increases such that's no longer profitable. Now, the issue with this is that they can essentially, even though you know each additional spam token they uh, put on the network raises the rent fee slightly for the next spam token, they can still do this very fast and very quickly take up the cheapest rent options with all of this spam. And unlike in a rent balance approach, even though the spam has caused the uh, rent fees to be high for everyone else, because the spam did it first, they are not subject to those higher fees and you can't evict them. Which means you can have like this, um, essentially the, these events where if for whatever reason, the uh, bucket list size decreases and the rent fee decreases rapidly, you can have all of these spam tokens kind of come in and fill the gap and very quickly get the network up to that um, you know, high rent fee rate again um, at the cost of all of these spam entries taking up more time than they probably should. And so I think um, that's probably where I want to get the conversation uh, started and uh, open up the floor of questions. But those uh, are the biggest pros and cons of each. The pros of rent balance being, uh, you know, this eviction pressure and defeating these exploits natively uh, without like the need for like a maximum rent balance or something like that. Uh, the con being downstream systems and usability. Garand, uh, there was a question uh, around the downstream systems. Can you just uh, quickly outline the, the difference or specifically with expiration ledger, what would be the downstream uh, systems kind of like expectations? Yeah, so I think the, um, the, the issue with the uh, rent balance versus expiration ledger is just that um, an expiration ledger we can put in meta so that the um, downstream systems can be directly told what the expiration ledger is. Uh, but there's no way to emit meta for the variable rent balance bumps just because they're too frequent. So for instance, with expiration ledger, just because it's set a single time um, on creation or whenever an entry has its uh, is expiration or its um, lifetime extended, what you can do is just emit meta that says, okay, this key has this lifetime. And then they store it in a SQL database. And then whenever you access that entry, you can just spit out the lifetime easy. Uh, and so you can contain all that information in meta. With rent balance, the issue is the initial rent balance is in the meta, sure. So say like this has a starting value of 1,000 XLM. But the issue is every ledger has a variable amount that's deducted from that 1,000 XLM. And because every single ledger or every single ledger entry is subject to this variable rent every single uh, ledger close, what we'd have to do is if for, to contain this information in meta, literally submit a meta entry uh, for every single entry uh, on the ledger periodically with the updated uh, rent information. And that's just not possible. And so essentially the downstream systems would have to manage this rent balance themselves. And we could probably emit the um, variable rent fee as meta every ledger close, but then it would be the responsibility of the downstream systems to implement essentially the rent balance uh, bookkeeping themselves, if that makes sense. Uh, it it does sound for the most part like like a win win. So I definitely want to on uh, kind of like focus on like what are the pros um, of um, of the current rent balance system compared to expiration ledger. Yeah, so I think the it comes to to eviction pressure and kind of um, not being exploitable or being uh, more game proof. And so that's the primary issue with locking in a um, essentially a rent fee at creation time is that you open up these vulnerabilities for the kind of like a contract storage middleman and for uh, long life spam entries that increase rent fees for everyone else. And so those are the two kind of, I think, exploits that we want to prevent happening. Um, and so if we can find essentially uh, suitable uh, limitations on the expiration ledger, like one limitation being not allowing arbitrarily li large lifetimes uh, to defeat those two exploits, then I think it would be a, a, good, a good decision. There's also a couple of other drawbacks. I think these are all solvable problems, but just something to think about is that there's certain issues, like because you're locking in an expiration ledger, um, 
there are questions about what to do whenever you uh, resize an entry. So for instance, say you create an entry that's only one byte large and say, okay, I want it to have an expiration ledger 10 years from now. And so you pay um, the rent fee uh, for 10 years, but um, for only one byte. And then two ledgers later, you say, oh, this entry is now 100 kilobytes. Um, then you essentially need to reconcile, okay, what do we do in this situation? Do we either A, shorten the lifetime because the rent fee is now higher because it's um, you know a larger entry size? Um, just for reference, the rent fee is charged per byte. Um, and so you need to pay more rent in order to have the same expiration ledger you did before. And so my current thinking for that particular edge case is that the expiration ledger uh, should never decrease. For instance, um, a write or an update or um, changing the size of an entry should never decrease its lifetime. Uh, it should only match or increase the lifetime, which means that if you have an entry that has, say, 10 years worth of, um, or that has an expiration ledger 10 years in the future, if you resize that entry, then you, what you need to do is you need to pay for essentially the difference. So you'd have to pay in this example, if you had a one byte entry and now it's a you know 10 byte entry, you'd have to pay for 10 bytes or for the nine additional bytes um, whenever you do that update. And so I think um, there are like issues like that. Um, and then the two exploit exploitability cases that rent balance solves really um, elegantly because rent balance, you, you know, um, it's charged every ledger. And so if you resize it, um, then it'll, the, you know, new additional fees will just be picked up on the next ledger. And so it's handled automatically. And then these exploits are not possible just because um, your rent fee you're paying is always up to date. And so you can never game the system by locking in a rent fee early and then using it later when the rent fee is more expensive. Is there anyone on the stage or in the audience that want to speak in favor of rent balances? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I just, I'll just want to comment on this from a, from a product perspective. I definitely think that this is, this is a big win because, uh, the user experience of the previous, uh, proposal rent balances, uh, is definitely kind of like requires a bit of a complex mental model of what rent actually means, because when people, you know, pay rent, they are used to kind of like locking a specific rate for a specific given of time, a specific given amount of time. So I do think that this new proposal kind of like sits better with like a mental model of, of what rent actually is, even though we're not using the word rent here. Um, um, one question that I also asked on discord, um, is around a, the question of, uh, uh, temporary entries and to the question of like auto bumps. And what is what are the implications for these? Yeah, so I think my current thinking is that we should still have auto bumps, um, but the auto bump should be optional. Um, and optional, uh, well, let me ex explain what I mean by optional. And so I think um, in this system, we still want an auto bump system uh, such that, you know, frequently used entries um, and shared entries such as contract instances and uh, contract code WASM are paid for. And so what I was envisioning is that before we were like bumping by some you know, amount of XLM, now because we have this expiration ledger interface, we would just um, bump by some modest amount, like 10 ledgers per access um, automatically. And so what that would look like is that you would pay at the current market rate, um, whatever the current rent fee is uh, for the extension. And so even if the entry say had like three years worth of rent um, that was paid for two years ago, so it was very cheap, Whenever you access it, you would still need to pay for the additional 10 ledgers at the current market rate. Um, and so that's for automatic bumps. I think um, what we should do for auto bumps is, especially for temporary entries, there were use cases where auto bumps are useful and use cases where auto bumps are not. And so I think when creating an entry, what you should do is on the initial item creation, you can set a flag and that flag is either auto bumps, uh, true, false. And so um, what this allows you to do is that the original developer, when you're creating the entry, can choose if this entry is something that should be bumped or something that is like, you know, short lived, so it should expire. And then, um, whenever you access that entry, that flag is stored in the ledger entry. And so, um, the access auto bump is determined by that initial create time flag. And so I think auto bumps are optional, 
but they're not optional um, by the entity that's accessing the entry. Uh, they're optional um, based on the entity that's creating the entry, if that makes sense. And so I think that makes the most sense. Now, another thing for temporary entries is because we now have this expiration ledger, I know before we kind of went back and forth as to, you know, if we should have expirate or temporary entries with like firm um, or exact um, cutoffs or not, or, or like that expire on the exact ledger entries. And so I think um, under this system, um, now that we don't use rent balances, that should be very possible and easy to do, such that um, you can now use temporary entries for security features, such that if you want an entry that lasts exactly 100 ledgers, what you would do is just say, um, make a temporary entry, set the expiration ledger to, um, you know, or set the TTL to 100, and then um, set auto bump to false. Um, now, I think we still need to, uh, actually, I still need to think about that a little bit more um, as to if we can, because right now we are allowing both temporary and restorable entries to be bumped by anyone, anytime. Uh, and so I take back that I said they still might not be appropriate for security uses out of the box. Um, but so what I'm kind of envisioning right now is the auto bump flag. And then um, in addition to the automatic bumps on access, which both temporary and restorable entries um, have, uh, you can also still manually bump any entry, both temporary and restorable, um, via an operation. And that operation is similar to what was in rent balance, but now you just specify um, the new expiration ledger. And then my thinking is that whenever you bump or whenever you pay for more, uh, you can either, there's two options here, sorry. Tomer, were you saying something? No, sorry. Oh, so I think um, there's, uh, whenever you do a manual bump operation to extend the expiration ledger, there are two ways we could think about it. First, you could either be credited for the amount you've already paid and then view it as an extension. So for instance, say, um, you know, I have a um, ledger that's set to expire in a year and I want to expire it to expire in 18 months. One potential uh, solution would be um, the rent bump operation only charges you at the current market rate for six more months of rent. It says, hey, there's already, you know, 12 months uh, of rent here. So we're only going to charge you for the additional six. So the total comes out to 18 months. That's option one. Now the drawback to that option is again, for that first 12 months, you're locking in a lower rate. Um, and that last six months is now at the market rate. So that's option one. Option two is that whenever you do a manual bump, you don't count the previous balance and the previous balance is burned. Um, what this would be is that if you know there's an entry that you want to live 18 months, but it currently lives, it currently has an expiration that's only 12 months in the future, you have to pay 18 months of rent at the current market price, and then the expiration ledger is reset. And that in this way, essentially, the 12 months that was already there is burned, and you're charged for the entire 18 months at the market rate. Now, the advantage to this is again, I think um, for a network health perspective and to prevent gameability, we want to be charging as close to market rates whenever we can. And so in this system, uh, you always can be charging um, you know, the market rate. However, it's kind of a, a poor UX because you're burning this amount. Um, and it seems that like in something like this should be probably strictly additive. Uh, and so I guess as far as the, the two interfaces are concerned, what are your thoughts as to manual rent bumps? Uh, that was a lot. I, I just want to go back to a point you made earlier quickly about temporary entries. So if I understand correctly, you are suggesting that the temporary entries, if we do go for ledger expiration for, uh, expiration ledger, the, the, uh, the contract should be the same. That is, we're kind of like letting go of the whole short, medium, long terms and, uh, making it the exact same interface as restorable ledger entries. Yeah, I think so. Now, the one thing, though, is um, I initially said they were fit for security uses, but then I caught myself because right now any user can bump any entry, uh, which means that even if you have, say, like a KYC entry that's only supposed to last 128 ledgers and you initially set its um, expiration ledger to be 128 ledgers in the future, a malicious user could bump that uh, using the manual operation. And so I think for security purposes, um, we still need to, that still needs to be enforced at the contract level. Whereas like in this case, the contract would need to embed their own like TTL inside the temporary entry. 
um, just because you have this arbitrary bump. I mean, I guess we could add a flag that's like no bump to temporary entries, um, but that might be adding too many flags at this point um, because the current interface is anyone can bump anything. Okay, uh, thanks for answering that question. Uh, going back to auto bumps for a second, I do think, you know, I've been thinking about the the wallet and DAP experience um, and what they need to think about in terms of state expiration. And it does seem like auto bump doesn't negate the need for wallets and DAPs to actually be attentive to the ledger expiration times and to and to act on that, either um, either by like suggesting the user to do like a manual bump or to initiate a manual bump. So it it does seem like auto bump um, has this like implicit behavior to it in which we're like extending ledger uh, entry expiration times, but it doesn't actually, it, it like adds complexity to the system, but it doesn't actually remove complexity uh, from the implementation of, of like products. It, it makes things a bit less expected and predictable. Yeah, so, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, well I think um, the, the auto bumps serve a very specific purpose, or at least they were initially designed to serve a specific purpose. And this is the shared state. So for in your example, like um, like a DAP or like a, a wallet, right? Um, this is um, not a good example for auto bumps because you have a particular balance entry that you care about and no one else really cares about. And so for a wallet perspective, um, say you want your wallet to live for one year, the correct answer is not just to keep you balancing it with via a smart contract so you auto bump it, but rather just to do a manual operation and then to bump that by a year. The uh, use case for auto bumps is more for contract instances and contract WASM. Um, particularly WASM is a difficult one because you can have a single WASM blob that many different contract instances use. And the question is, who pays for that WASM blob? And so uh, essentially by having like this auto bump feature, that every user who touches it is required to pay a little bit, um, then you can essentially like uh, share the cost of you know this contract and this contract instance or this contract code in this contract instance among all the users who are using it. And so I think the auto bump feature was specifically um, for these kind of shared resources that there is no clear owner. Um, for instance, like USDC, it'd be kind of a crappy interface if you know ten thousand people used it a day, but there was no auto bump. And then the 10,000 first person had to go pay rent because it got archived or something. And he was just the, or they were just the, uh, the unlucky user that draw the short straw. And so I think there definitely still is a pretty strong use case for auto bumps for these sort of different entry types. Um, but I agree for something like a, a DAP or a, a wallet, you would still need, you know, this manual operation in addition to auto bumps. Would you recommend a ledger entry that is a user specific, like a balance or an LP position to be auto bumpable or not auto bumpable? I mean, um, I think it just depends on the, the contract implementation. I don't think it needs to be auto bumpable the same way that contract instances and stuff do, but I don't see like a, a downside. I think the general thinking is, um, the, the kind of design model I had in my head is that extending a lifetime should never be negative. Um, that like, like this is why it's not good for security cases because anyone can extend any lifetime such that it should always be a positive action. Um, it cannot be a negative action. And so I think, um, you know, I think there was talks last time of uh, exposing an auto bump flag. And I think that's probably makes the most sense that, you know, contract instances and contract WASM code um, you don't have this option whenever you deploy it. It has it. It must be auto bumped. But then for any other key you create, I think you probably just give the option to, or or should we just because because there's also like um, I mean you could also say that the contract instances and contract code are auto bumped and nothing else is, but then you can kind of get into this uh, sticky situation where there are still contract types that have shared state. So for instance, if you can think like a um a like a, a dex right um and there's like this um asset pair that start as an entry. And many different people are like viewing or trading that asset pair. You wouldn't want one individual to be stuck with the bill. And so I think that there are still, I, I still think auto bump is a powerful primitive. And I think it should probably be enabled by default just because it's the safest route. 
Um, but I think, you know, having uh, a option to turn it off, especially for personal state like balances is probably a good idea. Uh, and so now that I've talked for a little bit, I think the answer to your question, I would probably say for something like a token balance, I would probably say no to the auto bump behavior, just because it's something that will probably like the lifetime of which will be explicitly managed by a wallet. I think yeah. For, for, can I add something? Yeah, like on the on the Wasm auto bump because I, I I agree it's kind of needed. The one thing that maybe like um, I'm thinking about there is that so for the first version we can do you know something like that, right? Like I would imagine that maybe in the future we would want to have like uh, maybe something that that kind of uh, auto tunes over time because like in in the example of like the uh, you have like a very uh, you know active contract. The WASM is basically going to be used multiple times per ledger, and you end up with really reaching your limit uh, fairly quickly. And then when the limit is reached, you actually are back into that situation where uh, you know some users are going to bump, some are not going to bump. Um, like basically, the first one in the ledger right <laughs> ends up bumping, and then. Um, yeah, that, that and also like the uh, if the what if the blob is is uh, fairly large, um, maybe that auto bump ends up ends up adding quite a bit of cost to uh, each uh, individual transaction. If it's you know bumping like for a, sig uh, a good number of ledgers, let's say you know a hundred ledgers or something. So maybe something to keep in mind. Garen, there is a question about the mechanics of auto bump from Paul. Can you uh, expand a bit on when does auto bump actually occur? Yeah, so the uh, current strategy is that auto bump occurs on all access, which is both read and write access. How this works under the hood is that, um, you know, in addition to having the expiration ledger stored in the ledger entry, we also have like this kind of shell entry type um, that is used for read only access. So for instance, like for your WASM blob, uh, they're um, only access read only. Um, and essentially to modify a ledger entry in the bucket list, you have to rewrite the entire entry um, at the top level bucket. And so if we were to modify the, um, you know, the entry or the, the expiration ledger directly in the ledger entry, you'd have to rewrite the entire WASM blob. And so to avoid this, we have like this um, kind of shim entry type, which is just an expiration ledger extension. And so this entry is very small. It's literally just a key and then the new expiration ledger. And so we use this entry type um, whenever we want to bump a read-only entry. And so in the WASM use case, even though you're only reading the WASM, um, because we are auto-bumping, you do have to do a small write, but that write is very small. Um, it's the minimal size write you can do. And so we are implicitly turning every read into a read-write. Um, but we're not rewriting the entire entry. We're reading the entire entry and then writing a very small entry uh, with the new expiration ledger. And so under the hood, that's how we implement it efficiently. Um, rent bumps for both reads and writes. I do want to touch on something that you mentioned before, which is the question of uh, uh, should bumping, uh, like bumping in general, should that be a flag? Uh, it does feel like, you know, last week we talked a bit about, you know, very, various Oracle usage patterns. And, uh, you know, we got to a conclusion where sometimes the contract developer would want to limit uh, or give an upper boundary to when a, a ledger entry should exist. And, uh, and making it non-bumpable is a very kind of like easy way to do that. Uh, the question is like, does that uh, overcomplex the system? Well, so I guess we have, we have two different questions here. Um, I think we have the question of, do we want to, uh, um, does the entry um, auto bump? And then does the entry allow bumps? Um, and so I think uh, from an implementation standpoint, these would be very easy to implement. Um, we could just, you know, throw in a flags field on the ledger entry um, and define a couple of flags. I think the question is, 
is this, um, you know, making the user experience too complex? And so what this would look like is I think um, this would only be applicable to temporary entries. I think, um, or, okay, so let's talk about the auto bump flag first. I think the auto bump flag, um, whether or not this um, item is auto bumped on access, uh, could be an optional flag for both temporary and restorable entries. But I think it should be uh, strictly enforced for contract WASM and contract instances. Now for the, um, should you allow bumps at all? I think we could allow that flag, but that flag could only be used for temporary entries. Um, and so this would be the use case where you either have like a security use case, um, where you want this to live exactly some number of ledgers, or the Oracle use case where the thing is only valid for five minutes or whatever. And then uh, if you set this flag, then this entry would not receive auto bumps, and it would also uh, not be bumpable by the manual operation. And if you tried to bump it, it would just fail or panic or something like that. Now, you would only want this flag on temporary entries because restorable entries and unique entries should always be bumpable. Um, they, they don't necessarily need to always have auto bumps, but they should always be bumpable just because they are important information that needs to be saved, which is why they are subject to being um, sent to the state expiration node when they expire. And so just because um, the design parameter for this entry is that it's supposed to be important live state, um, there should be no use cases where you wouldn't want to bump or wouldn't want to allow a unique or restorable entry to be bumpable. And so I think that is the, um, the most technically complete kind of interface. Um, it's very you know feasible from a core perspective. The only question is if that's too much complexity at the end user. I think that as you described this, um, if it creates more divergence between temporary entries and restorable entries, then probably for the sake of simplicity, I say we shouldn't include it, especially because this is something that the contract developer can uh, program for in their contract. I will say if we if we go this route and say if we I think so so if I'm understanding you correctly, we don't want divergence, and so we'd have an auto bump flag. Um, true, false, but we would not have the no bump flag. I think if we go this route, we need to be very clear in our documentation that the expiration ledger is not absolute. Um, because if you used to, you know, have like a temporary entry, self delaying entry, and then there's a field called expiration ledger, it's a reasonable assumption that the ledger would be deleted immediately after that ledger. And if we don't have this no bump flag, that's not the case because a malicious user could, you know, invoke the operation and bump any temporary entry, even if auto bump is disabled. And so, uh, you know, I think that's a fine interface decision to make that all entries are bumpable. But I think we need to make that very clear um, just from a, a UX perspective so that we don't have security issues with temporary entries being used improperly. Any questions or comments on this? Uh, what do people think about? Um, should we have the bump bumpable flag? I was going to type a big thing, but I could actually just say it. Um, I think I would vote for having not having an auto bump flag, if possible, just having like fewer configuration options with the different types of storage. Like there's two different types of storage and they act differently. I think that's fine to explain and understand. But if you have to say, okay, there's restorable entries and there's temporary entries and they act in this way, unless you enable auto bump on them. And then restorable entries do like you know what I mean. There's like four different configurations now versus just two. So Paul, are you talking about the bumpable flag or the auto bumpable flag? Sorry, yes, sorry, bumpable. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. It's just not uh, everything because bumped. Um, but just so I understand, are we still um? interested in the auto bump flag or do we also want to next say that and just say everything auto bumps as well i definitely don't think that everything should be auto bumpable by default um yeah it does sound like for a com from a completeness perspective having both of these flags kind of like covers um most use cases I mean, one thing we can do is just for, like, if we don't want to expose the bumpable flag now, we can just define it in the XDR and define it in core, but just not expose in the SDK. Um, and then turn that on V2 if we want to, you know, 
have a more complicated um, UX matrix for storage. Um, that would at least give us future proofing. Or like I think actually if we just if if we are defining auto bump anyway, um, then we need to have a flags field for the auto bump flag, and so we can easily extend it later. Um, and so I think, you know, the bumpable versus no bumpable that could be a V two feature. Um, but I think unless there's like a strong strong one for it now, we can just leave that off for now and just have the auto bump flag. Garrett, I'm not sure that the auto bump really benefit the network. It might benefit the ease of use, but not necessarily the network itself, right? Sure. I guess the you are um, having more more IO churn for sure. Um, but I guess the there didn't seem to be a great solution for the contract instance and contract wasm case without auto bump. So I think you know it, it for, for it might be useful to say maybe like um. I think those two entries need something like auto bump or need some way of essentially like um, automatically or pooling rent together in some way, because that was kind of the, um, the the thing we were trying to think about with the contract WASM is, okay, you have like four or five different instances that all have the same WASM backend. How do you equitably and equally share the load when it comes to expiration ledgers? Are you... <clears throat> I, I think that my point, my, the direction that I'm thinking about is that if someone was uploading a contract, I want to see his or theirs involvement in the future on maintaining that and not so much on leaving it and assuming that it will be funded by someone else. Like I, I want to see like a activity, right, on, on that a contract from the owner and not by a, someone else that might be inherently using it. Oh, the issue is that contracts don't have an owner. Like, Wasm can be supported by anyone and used by anyone. So, you know, if you have a, say, I don't know, liquidity pool implementation, that people are using. Um, there is no clear owner. Yes, someone might have written the code, but anyone can deploy it. And yeah, it's kind of hard to track to anyone and demand, you know, maintenance from someone. Um, which, uh, I mean, you could expect it, but it's like you kind of uh, universally demand this. Yeah, I feel like there's kind of the, the concept of like a library contract is definitely a big thing on Ethereum. And so mm -hmm. it feels like an unfair expectation to write something like a like a DAP implementation that has, you know, that's that's more of a library function and expect the library owner to be the sole payer for that, even though other contract instances are using that WASM and making money off the WASM. It just seems weird that if five, you know, different contract instances are using and profiting off of WASM. That only the you know entity that originally deployed the WASM should be on the hook for paying for it. So I would argue that if someone is using something for free, then he shouldn't. Instead, he should either pay the author, right, and generate money right out of that, right, or basically copy it and. If from now on, on, he would be the owner of that piece. Well, but what do you mean by copy, though? I feel like that's yeah. way worse for network perspective because now you have like five identical copies of the same WASM yeah. running around. Yeah, the current design is explicitly like encouraging sharing the code because we don't want to store like uh, tens or hundreds of duplicate WASM blobs because it's the like, biggest ledger entries uh, by far. So, you don't want to encourage copy paste and you know fragment system or anything. And again, like, like I think I I might be wrong here, but in ETH role, like a lot of the things are implemented by proxy patterns and stuff like that. Where again, a lot of instances are referring to say another single contract instance, and 
you know, you do not deploy your own like copy of Uniswap and you do not maintain it instead of which you can just uh, refer to a proxy instance of Uniswap that is yes, getting updated by someone probably, but I don't think it's fair to say that, hey, do your own thing. Um, yeah. I know. I would be happy to see some incentive model in incorporated here in, uh, as part of that. But you know, maybe that's something that we need to you know like think separately of the arm fees. Tom, do you have any thought about that? Yeah, I think we we should allow the. We should allow contracts to be detached from a concept of an owner. Uh, you know, for for a lot of legal reasons, this is better for some contracts. You know, like the Uniswap contracts are non upgradable; they don't have an owner, uh, and and that's the way they want it. Like it exists like that for a reason, right? Uh, so I don't think we should we should kind of like over overemphasize this concept of an owner. Okay, that's a good argument. Aaron, do you think it would be reasonable to constrain auto bump to these entries, which are the ones which are going to benefit from the most? So not all ledger entries, not contract data, but just the contract code and the contract instances? Yeah, I think contract code and contract instances for sure. Um, but I think there's also... Uh, the, the reason why I wanted to define auto bump is I think there's also areas where contract data should be auto bumped. So, like for instance, like a, if you have like a DEX, um, and then there are like entries on the DEX that many users of the DEX use, um, the auto bump feature is kind of just so that these entries are kind of like paid for by all users instead of you know one unlucky user. So I think um, I think there's still there are definitely use cases where you'd want something like an auto bump primitive. Or contract data. Um, however, I could definitely see a use case where this is not the default and is a flag, where contract instances and contract WASM uh, receive bumps um, by requirement, and then data defaults to false, but you can turn it on if you want. Because I, th I still think there are definitely use cases where you'd want something like this for contract data. I don't know if it's a common case, but there definitely are uh, significant cases. I think it's a very common case, like effectively everything in a in a contract that is like a global variable or global state that doesn't specifically adhere to to an account, like you know, like in a liquidity pool, the actual like pool values are global um, and need to be bumped. We have been discussing this uh, for some time. Uh, what about uh, explicitly tying the data to the contract instance, like? Do we anticipate some third case where you know the data is kind of global, but it's not once per contract or something? If not, then maybe we just for the small global state of the contract uh, in the instant entry, and then you know it's subject to the same auto bomb policy. Because if you think about it, it's kind of a part of the contract instance. Okay. Um, uh, that's another consideration here. I mean, I guess the question is how monolithic do we want it to be, right? Because the issue with that is that um, the so say the advantage is that like if you have like a a contract instance that's like has a very large amount of global state, every call must bump all that state. Whereas like so for instance for the liquidity pool, so there's like a, a poor implementation that has like uh, ten different like asset swaps or something. And so even if you only access one, you have to bump the other nine implicitly. Whereas um, if you don't tie it all and you keep everything individual, then you only have to bump the entries you actually touch. Um, now, I don't know, like in practice, uh, contracts might be small enough that this isn't really a big issue. It definitely does simplify some things and decreases our write amplification as well, because you'd only need to write at most one bump per contract instance. So this effectively yeah, goes back to our... Right. Sorry, go ahead, Lee. I think it's difficult to distinguish between global and individual because like, there are definitely going to be contracts that have like nexuses 
like where it's not global, but maybe it involves like multiple p- participants. Um, so I don't know, like where do we draw the line between <clears throat> something should be a shared cost versus being an individual cost? It's, it seems too difficult to do that. Yeah, other than like the really general cases of contract code should definitely be a shared cost. Um, like in, for contract data, I don't think we can make that call. Like I think the contract developer has to. I personally think the safest option is just to default this to true and then maybe expose a flag just because I feel like the benefit or the, the drawback to auto bumping something where when it shouldn't be auto bumped is very minimal. Because the whole idea is that for the bump to be a small bump, such that if lots of users are accessing it over time, it grows. But for instance, right, if you have a balance, um, it you know, and you say view balance, and you have to pay ten extra ledgers of rent on the one entry. I mean, that will literally like that might be less than like uh, an XLM that would be measured in strips. And so I feel like the the drawback to not having auto bumps can be high if you have uh, a shared you know um, you know global entry that you forget to bump. And then uh, for the entire lifetime of that contract, you have to manually bump it, um, it's expensive. I feel like that's a much worse failure case than the other case where you sometimes have to pay uh, a small additional fee to access some entries. Leaning into that, is there is there a really a big downside to not requiring auto bump? Like What's not having the option, not making it configurable at all. Oh yeah, just like requiring it like universally. I personally think there's, I, th- I think there's not a, I think there maybe is one negative use case where you have Oracle data um, that should really only live for like five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, it would be really annoying if, you know, especially if this data is accessed often in like a, like a DEX sort of environment. I think that would be really annoying if you access this thing so much in a five minute lifetime, such that it always lives for like six hours or like two weeks after um, you know, even though you should only do five minutes. So I think for like very short lived um, entries and like Oracle data, there's a strong use case. Outside of that, I don't see a super strong use case um, for for not just requiring auto bumps everywhere. Hey, um, are you suggesting setting it to true for every type of entry or just for restorable entries? Because like for the Oracle use case that you're describing, Garand, wouldn't they use temporary entries for that? Yeah, yeah. So I think um so I think right now we are talking about a unified interface where both restorable and temporary have the same expiration ledger interface and both have the same auto bump okay. interface. Yeah, I, f- I feel like contracts couldn't contracts avoid the issue that you're describing, um, you know, where where you accidentally continue to rebump a temporary entry by I guess like moving on to using like a, a contract that uses a temporary entry only for five minutes. I guess how how would people be referencing that like an hour from now? Well, no, so that's the issue, right? So it's that no one is referencing it an hour from now, but in that five minutes, enough people referenced it such that it was auto bumped so much that it will live significantly longer than five minutes. So the issue is no one will access it within an hour, but it will live you know an hour, two hours, or however long. Um, so yes. this, I think what you're just, I guess, so what if auto bumping wasn't, uh, didn't bump it a fixed amount? What if it bumped up to some cap? I mean, it does bump up to some cap, um, because we have, uh, we have a, um, a maximum rent balance, uh, or a maximum expiration ledger due to, you know, issues we discussed earlier. And so there is a cap. It's just that the issue is that, um, you know, that cap will make sense for some entries, but doesn't make sense for others. So for instance, like if the cap is six months and in the extreme case, you have an Oracle entry that was supposed to last five minutes that lasts up to the cap of six months, that's a lot of wasted fees. Okay, so it sort of feels. Go ahead, Lee. Sorry, it sort of. So, uh, sorry, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I think on this, uh, it sort of feels like auto bump. Okay, you, we could argue that 
auto bomb should be configurable per, per entry, but it also sounds like the amount of this thing should be auto bumped. If we're, if we're making it configurable, it's not really a binary yes or no, it's more like an amount. Like as a contract developer, um, the contract developer is really probably like the person who's going to know best like how long if this is going to get bumped it needs to be bumped for or i guess it's some combination of the contract developer and the user but yeah just i'm I'm a little skeptical of allowing contracts to define you know like excess v amounts right because if a contract was like oh you know like even if it's mm -hmm. not malicious if it's just like a, a stupid design it's like hey this should have six months and it's like a you know thousand or it's like a you know 10 kilobyte entry that you know requires right. a six month bump just to access. That's a pretty poor UX. Yeah, and like this is just the slippery slope of configurability. Like yeah. the, the more, I yeah. In some ways, maybe we need, um, you know, to Paul's point around like not making things configurable. Uh, maybe that's just the trade off we make. We make it okay. Like temporary entries might get bumped more than what they need to. They might live around a little bit longer, but that's a trade off for. Um, for all these other reasons. Okay, so we're at time. Um, it definitely sounds like um, everyone's on board with Ledger Exploration, uh, moving on from Rent Balance. Um, there are the questions of which flags we expose. And there is the question that Dima raised about revisit revisiting the, the idea of contract attached state, which we decided uh, against in the context of metadata, uh, but uh, that wasn't, uh, um, yeah, there wasn't a landslide of opinions there. So maybe it's worth, um, we thinking about that. So, Garen, uh, it does sound like you have a lot to work with right now in terms of ledger expiration. Um, I would try to summarize this question about which kind of flags uh, we've we've just debated and and starting a discussion around that uh, to give people some asynchronous time to think about that. Um, and Dima, if you could kind of like resurface this idea of kind of like contract attached state and uh, the benefits of that, um, both in this context and in others, I think that could be beneficial. Uh, Garen, is there anything else you? No, I think uh, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, Dima, I saw you unmuted for a sec there. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, yeah, when I have some time, I'll... Right. I guess yeah. the main issue with the contract data is that relate really time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I I don't know if you will have enough time to get it shipped into one, even if everyone is on board. But yeah, uh, yeah I need to think a bit more about this. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a great session. See you all next week. <laughs>